Tonight, we are excited to have with us director Marcus Clark, who made the excellent Netflix documentary, Blood Brothers, Malcolm X, and Muhammad Ali. Please welcome Marcus Clark to the Q&A. Hey. Hello. Hello. Usually you would have a big class standing. <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we, listen, I, watched the movie last night after the US Open. <laughs> and um, it still stayed with me this morning. And that's usually a very good sign. It really is. And, um, you know, we want to ask you a lot of questions about it. But first, I wanted to know, <clears throat> how did you start in the business? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I actually got an internship uh, very, very young when I was 16 years old, uh, luckily. And the internship was for a commercial company that did uh, tabletop commercials, which, you know, for, for those don't know, don't know, it's like the, the food shots and the product shots in commercials. Um, so like Pizza Hut commercials where the cheese, the pizza gets pulled and the cheese pulls and the soda gets poured and the camera floats over all the food and makes it look beautiful. Um, that's like a specialty. And so I was an intern and a production assistant um, for a company called Santiago that specialized in tabletop commercials. Um, so very much like a fly on the wall in the business and then eventually just worked my way up um, from production assistant to production coordinator, production manager, um, eventually producing and then becoming a first assistant director in commercials. Um, and then soon after that, I kind of made the transition to directing. But really, um, I got a really early start in the business and I really stuck with it and kind of just worked my way up um you know over the years i'm going to have the student ask you how did you get uh, a job at 16 so <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> i'm going to ask them because you know so how did you get involved in this project yeah so actually my my agent william brown connected me to aaron sampson who's an executive uh with kenya barris's company and during that meeting, they told me they had the rights to this book. Kenya Barris and Lightbox, a production company here in LA, um, bought the rights to Blood Brothers, um, written by Randy Roberts and Johnny Smith. And so, you know, when I came in for the meeting, I knew, you know, I know a lot about Malcolm X, I knew a lot about Muhammad Ali, but I didn't actually know that they were friends. So, you know, immediately my ears perked up and I was like, well, you know, was this friendship real? Is this, is this documented? Do we know that this is real? <laughs> you know, I was a little dubious at first, to be honest. Um, so I did some research. And one of the first like preliminary research before I had the, the, the job and one of the first archival pieces I came, I found was Malcolm X um, publicly referring to Cassius Clay as his brother and another clip separately from a different time of Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali referring to Malcolm X as his brother. And so this was kind of the first fabric that showed me this was a real relationship. I, didn't, I hadn't heard either of them refer to anybody else publicly as brothers. Um, and it really underscored that there was a real relationship here and a real bond. Um, so I came back to Kenya with kind of my POV, my pitch for how I would approach the story matter, um, what moments I thought were most important and most pivotal, um, and kind of my perspective on how I'd tell the story. And he hired me soon after that, and it was kind of you know off to the races after that. Okay, so I have two questions about this. One is, why did your agent your agent knew about this book. So that's why he sent you, right? Yes, yes. He knew that they had purchased the rights to the book and that they were looking for a director. And apparently they had been looking for about a year or so um, for the right director. And, um, you know, my pitch really resonated with everybody in the room. And it was right after that, that I got put on the, put on the film. Okay, you, know, you make it sound so easy. I am going to... <laughs> so but I think it's good. It's inspiring many students like, yes, you can do it. So the other thing is, first of all, how does the film differ from the book, Blood Brothers? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the book is really, the book is great. I, I really enjoyed the book and it really outlines um, the movement of both men. Um, the authors did a really good job in terms of cross-referencing all the material that existed before, the books, the publications, the documentaries, um, the FBI surveillance documents, um, which actually gives us a lot of insight in terms of where they were and when. Um, and they, they kind of stitched it all together to, to, to outline this relationship. 
So the, the research is actually really powerful and was really helpful in terms of a foundation for um, where to look for archival material, what events, you know, should we, should we be focusing on? But for me personally, as you know, as a black man in America, there were there were certain um, cultural nuances, cultural sensitivities that I feel uh, they didn't really take into account or weren't amplified enough. And so my my goal, my mission was really to not only make it a story that was intimate um, and authentic, but really surround all this research um, with authentic voices who knew the men, um, with family members, and really trying to find as many firsthand accounts um, of people who were there as possible, or people who at least met or knew uh, both men. And that's really challenging because again, this story, besides the fact that the relationship's incredibly private, the story is 55, 56 years old. So really finding people, you know, finding people in the documentary world who were close to that relationship, close enough to, to describe it to me, um, was a real challenge. But we, we did come through with that. Um, you know, Rahman Ali is a big part of the film. And if you watch the film, which you have, and hopefully your students have as well, um, he's next to Ali all the time. Um, throughout his life, throughout his whole life, throughout his whole journey. And at moments, there's, he's even in between him and Malcolm X. And so, you know, he was really uh, Muhammad Ali's foundation, he's really his support system. And so to get that interview is something we're extremely fortunate and, and grateful for, because it really gives us kind of a new insight, unprecedented insight into the relationship, um, into what these men saw in each other, um, into what this bond was really about, and really how complicated the relationship is. Um, and so that was really kind of one of my goals. And I feel like we were able to achieve that. Yes. And so my question is, okay, the archives were there. Uh, Rahman Ali was there. Um, you know, some people found it, the guy who wrote the book, you found it. And mm -hmm. why do you think most projects about what happened at that time and those two men kind of glazed over that friendship. Yeah, that, that to me was uh, the biggest element that made me really want to do this film, um, aside from the history and the responsibility of it, but how much of this information was really unknown. Um, you know, this, this relationship hasn't been well documented. It just hasn't, it hasn't been well explored. Um, and so you ask me why, uh, you know, it's, that's a tough question to answer. I think I, that I, I think I know why, but I want to hear from you. Yeah, of course. Well, I think, I think you know, I have to call out the obvious, which is, you know, Malcolm X as a civil rights leader has always been seen as explosive and incendiary and dangerous, and you know, his his image has been far more intimidating, let's say, than Martin Luther King or some of the other civil rights leaders that are really held up. And for that reason, I think there's been, you know, history in a way has has dampened his impact um, and, and kind of diluted his impact um, and, and kind of made it less important, less significant. And especially when it comes to the impact that he had on Muhammad Ali. Um, Muhammad Ali, you know, in 1996 and for, for much of his life is revered as an American hero. And even in his case, the legacy has changed over the years. Um, and Malcolm X's legacy has definitely changed over the years. And so I think most of it is fear of Malcolm X and the things that he was talking about, um, the way that he was speaking, um, the influence that he would have on other African-Americans. I think that's something that um, people have shied away from embracing. You know, he's an incredibly controversial figure from that time. You got to remember this is, you know, especially in this film, we're dealing with 1962 to 65. Um, so the things he was saying was like, you know, it was blowing people's minds. This was, no one had ever heard a black man speak like this before. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why uh, this, this relationship and his influence on Muhammad Ali, I think has been largely forgotten about in history. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, when Muhammad Ali chooses Elijah over Malcolm, uh, he says in the documentary, um, I, because, I was, I knew of the Nation of Islam before I knew Malcolm. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Because yeah, from, from the documentary that he maybe was introduced to it through Malcolm, no? So the story, the story goes, as, as we understand it, um, Cassius Clay met 
Sam Saxon, whose Muslim name is Abdul Rahman. That's the man who actually uh, formally, yeah, yeah. so to speak, introduces him to the nation of Islam and right. really gets him closer to the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. Now, what the movie also, what the film also points out is that in 1959, which may or may not be what he's referring to in that clip, he was exposed to this record, a white man's heaven is a black man's hell. Uh -huh. That record by Louis Farrakhan, um, Calypso Jean the Char Charmer at the time, that was a nation of Islam record. That, that, that philosophy that is talked about in that song um, derives from the nation of Islam and the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. And so he was exposed to the nation that, that they exist. He knew they existed. He knew they were a religious organization that was preaching something he was interested in. Um, and this record gave him that exposure. So when he meets Sam Saxon, Abdul Rahman in um, 62, he's then, uh, he's, he's then reintroduced again to something he was already interested in. But now Sam Saxon takes it a step further and really brings him in to the teachings and exposes him more to the nation of Islam. And then um, Sam Saxon is the man who actually brings him to meet Malcolm X um, on that fateful day. I remember, yeah, that trip, yeah. Yeah, so and, he had heard about it. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. It was just kind of heartbreaking um, because, you know, it was kind of heartbreaking to see that uh, Muhammad Ali, you know, stuck with Elijah and so on and so forth. And now in retrospect, in retrospect, you see that Malcolm was right and <laughs> Elijah Muhammad was not really the person that he said that he was. And, every, you know, people were saying about Malcolm that at the core of it, he was a, a gentleman. And mm -hmm. you know, I find it a lot in life. I feel that people that are confrontational and this and that the end, the inside they're soft and gentle. And the people that are like, oh, so swift in public, I really have a heart of steel inside. So yeah. it's very interesting to me, basically to do it. Um, how long after, I don't know if you know, but how long after uh, Malcolm X died, was murdered, um, did Muhammad Ali leave uh, the Nation of Islam? Was so, it after Elijah died or before Elijah died? So it's about 10 years after Malcolm X is assassinated. Malcolm X is assassinated in 1965. Um, Elijah Muhammad passes away in 1975. Um, and right after his passing or soon after his passing, um, Muhammad Ali converts to a more traditional form of Islam and and leaves the nation essentially. Um, and so, you know, there's uh, there's an interesting, I guess you could call it a coincidence, but I tend to think, you know, out of respect, he stayed in the nation until Elijah Muhammad passed away. And then when that happened, he moved on. Um, and very similarly to Malcolm, you know, a lot of his, uh, his mental journey, his mental kind of uh, maturity came from his travels to Africa um, and his travels to Mecca that really changed his perspective on a lot of things. Um, so yeah, it was about 10 years after that he actually leaves the nation. And, you know, I think it took him some time to really wrestle with uh, these issues of regret and remorse. And, you know, to just go back to what you mentioned before, I think it's important for people to remember that Cassius Clay was young. He yeah. was like 22 years old when this stuff is happening. So, you know, people tend to forget Malcolm X was 17 years older than him. You know, that's a significant difference. If you're, you know, I don't know how I would have dealt with that at 22. I don't know if I could have dealt with that at 22. Um, and there's all these really heavy dynamics going on around him between the Nation of Islam, between the people who are the followers, between Malcolm X, between the surveillance that they're under. Like these are really intense factors for anybody to deal with and juggle with and try to make the right decision. Um, there's a lot of pressures there. So, you know, while I have a different kind of, perspective in a way, I don't blame him because I realized just how challenging um, this decision and this situation was for someone to be in. You also, you also feel that he was brainwashed and part of it, because you know, he's, he's brilliant in a different way that Malcolm, Malcolm is all intellect, you know, mm -hmm. brilliant in that way. And Ali is basically, you know, um, street smart in a way and um 
so I can see, but you can see when he start talking, you can see that Elijah Muhammad basically, you know, that whole machine just went, mm -hmm. you know, but it was heartbreaking between the two of them. The last part mm -hmm. really was just uh, very touching, I have to say. Very, very much so, very much so. Yeah. Very touching. How did you find this amazing, amazing footage that people didn't see? I was with uh, other people and they're all like, well, we never yeah. seen it. Those yeah, are that history was... buff and they're like, well, we've never <laughs> seen it. Well, thank you for that. That's, uh, I have to give all of that credit um, to Julianne Galdamas, who is our archivist producer. Um, she's an incredible archivist and she was able to really hunt down a lot of these clips and a lot of this footage which is really difficult. Um, you know, I think the book gave us a good kind of a roadmap for where yeah. to look um, yeah. and for what could exist. And then it's really hitting the pavement, calling these outlets directly, or, you know, this stuff is from the 60s. So sometimes you're calling outlets that don't exist anymore. Um, new stations that are no longer around that got bought by somebody else. So you have to really um, work the phones. Um, you know, you're asking for interviews. Did you do, inter do you have all the interviews from this given date? Then you have to go through and watch all those interviews and then you have to find the clip of Ali and then you have to find the moment you like. There's really no quick, there's no like Google search function, so to speak, for archival material. You really have to do the work. Um, and it's a whole, it's a, it's, a, it's a talent and it's a skill all by itself. Um, there was definitely some stuff that I found and that I would find and say, can we track this down? You know, find out where the source of this material is. Um, but it was really her and her team that was able to mine all of this different material from the National Archives, um, from UCLA, from the Schomburg, um, to pull all these different pieces together because they don't all exist in one place. Um, so a big part of the process was finding all of that archival material and uh, being able to license it, clear it, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. I think it's time for me. Do we have any questions from the shy students? They start shy and then they- Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> we do. Um, we do. We have a question here from Jaime B. Jaime, we've okay. enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Marcus? Hi. Um, uh, I love the movie so much. I actually tweeted you about it and you like my tweet. That's how much I loved it. And I was just wondering <laughs> through the course of the movie, did your opinion on either legacy change uh, after you learned everything you learned? Thank you for your question. Um, yeah, so I would say um, I have way more knowledge now of both men and in terms of what made them tick, in terms of what made this relationship and this bond work. I don't wanna say it didn't change my opinion of them because I see Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, both of them as heroes. Um, that hasn't changed, but I do think knowing some of these dynamics, some of the mistakes that they may have made on the way um, and these intense pressures they were under and trying to make a decision and trying to stand for something. Um, I do have a lot, a greater insight on all of that now. And I do think, you know, one of the things I try to do with this film is like, we can talk about people's mistakes and, and transgressions and, you know, missteps while also celebrating the fact that they're heroes. Um, I really firmly believe in that. And so, I don't think any of the material in this film, in my opinion, it doesn't take away. Um, in fact, it's additive, in my opinion, to their legacies and to who they were and to our understandings of them. Um, I feel like my, my understanding of them is better, but my perspective on them hasn't really changed. You know, and I've seen some of the commentary on Twitter and some people are, you know, like, I can't believe Ali did that. I'm so mad. I'm so upset. It breaks my heart. Right. But it doesn't, I don't, again, I don't blame him because I understand just how challenging these dynamics are. Right. Um, you know, when you're talking about life and survival and what you stand for, and you're trying to be, you have a mission, you're trying to be the greatest, you're trying to do all these things. It's complicated and it's challenging. Um, so yeah, I still have the utmost respect for both of them. They're still my heroes, um, but I feel like I have a greater understanding of who they are now. And did somebody say, uh, you know, the nation was an organization and Malcolm was just one person. And if you believe that the message is more important than the person, then the nation has the power and the organization, you know, to mm -hmm. spread the message. So that could be part of it also. Yeah, I mean, Zaire Ali is the uh, commentator at that moment. He basically says, you know, Malcolm was an individual 
and Elijah was an institution. Yeah. And that really sets up the stakes and it sets up this fork in the road for Muhammad Ali, for Cassius Clay at the time, which is the source. People have to understand that the thing that really bonds them is the nation of Islam and the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. That is what actually brings them together because the nation at that time is telling them they are divine and that they have a history that they are unaware of. And if they understood their history, then they'd understand their true potential, which is essentially the opposite of what we're told in America for hundreds of years. We've been told we're inferior. We've been told we're less than. We've been told we're two thirds of a man. All these things that bring down your value and your self-worth. And the nation is there saying the complete opposite, which is saying you can achieve anything, you can become godly, you can you, you are divine. And so that message is incredibly powerful and compelling. But when it comes to Muhammad Ali's choice, he chooses the source of the message rather than going with Malcolm. Yeah, he, maybe he should have gone with Malcolm out of uh, loyalty to his brother, but he was trying to be loyal to his faith and to the source of all the material. Um, Because this material, as you can imagine, is incredibly powerful, um, which is, you know, part of the reason that Muhammad Ali is seen as the greatest. (laughs) And so that's a really, really compelling um, message. So it made it very challenging for him to step away from the source material um, to go with Malcolm. For him, it was it was more about staying, keeping an allegiance to to the nation and to Elijah Muhammad. So do you think that uh, calling himself the greatest was after he joined it or he was already, you know, cause he said, I'm pretty, but I don't remember whether he said I'm the greatest um, before he even knew about the nation. That's, uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I do think that, and I will definitely credit Zaire Ali again for this. Um, I do think there's a connection between his faith and people of, um, of Muslims saying, God is the greatest and God is great. And him saying, I am the greatest. There's definitely a dog whistle, if you will, almost like talking in code um, about what he's saying. He's equating himself to the greatest. And it's a saying that is, that is a mantra in Islam. Um, in what uh, is really, exactly. And what is really important for people to understand is the nation of Islam and what people may call traditional Islam, um, there are overlaps, but they are different in terms of their their core beliefs. Um, There's definitely similarities and there's definitely a lot that they share, but there's differences. And one of those core differences is in the nation of Islam, the black man is God. And so when Ali's saying that, he's he's saying this, this kind of you know, code almost. It's like a code talk almost. And if you know, you know. Um, so I do think there's a connection to his faith and him calling himself the greatest and, and, and pronouncing, I am the greatest, um, being equal to saying God is the greatest. Okay. But the nation, was it also the nation that said the, my, the white man is evil or it was just really Malcolm X, you know, coming from the background of his father and all yeah, no, that was definitely um, part of the teachings at that time. Um, at that time period, that was definitely part of the nation's teachings. And what the film, you know, I'm aware of that. And that's part of um, what we tried to do in the film, which is, you know, I want people to understand and kind of uh, have an understanding of why this group was appealing to Malcolm X and to Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay at the time. And that's why it's appealing. It's not just uh this inflammatory the white man is the devil they had real references all around them that they could not explain otherwise um and the only way to understand it which was provided as i understand it was provided by Elijah muhammad was to say well the white man must be the devil because they're hanging people they are abusing people they're killing people and people are you know supposed to be you know christianity but none of the principles are being upheld And so it's really this critique, um, which is really wild that this critique was even happening at that time, but I understand why, because of what they were seeing around them. And so, you know, I think that takes away some of the, some of the, uh, you know, I think people sometimes get the impression that they were in some type of, you know, you know, extremist organization, so to speak, and people might have that opinion, 
but this was grounded in the things they were seeing around them and right. it gave them an answer for how to navigate the world. Louis Farrakhan stills. But anyway, so let's go to the next question. Thank you for the explanation. Sure. I have a question that was submitted by Layla, uh, who I uh, cannot start her microphone, so I will uh, pose it for her. Question reads, your experience ranges from camera operator, producer, executive producer, and assistant director. How has this helped you when you're in the director's chair? Oh my goodness, that's a good question. So immensely, immensely. Um, my particular path to getting to director, um, I strongly recommend <laughs> because it really helps me to have a knowledge of what every single person does on the crew because I know what they do because I've done it. And it really helps because if you have an understanding of that, you know, trying to make a film is difficult already, okay? Just by itself, it's difficult. But the timing of it, scheduling of it, what is your crew capable of doing? Um, how much time does it take your crew to do the things that you're asking for? Um, these are all things that are extremely valuable in production, whether it's documentaries, feature films, TV or commercials, um, knowing what your crew is capable of and, and what the expectations should be and are is really, really valuable. Um, knowing what people should be doing when they're doing it, <laughs> very valuable because you have to be able to anticipate um, and you always kind of need to be a step ahead of everything that's happening. And, you know, you need to have a good chemistry with your crew. A director like myself or anybody else is only as good as their crew. They're only as good as the people who are helping them and supporting them and working with them. Um, so for me, it was really important. There was a time when, you know, I did a particular job and um, there was, because I didn't have a great enough understanding of the internal workings of the camera, it was affecting my position. And so on my next job, I made sure to learn camera inside and out, to physically shoot and to understand what, what are the capabilities of the camera? What, what can I shoot at night? What can I shoot in the day? How much light do I need? Um, all of these different factors, it's really important um, to know what everybody does and to actually have your hands, um, your hands on um, in terms of learning what those positions are uh, in, a, in a film crew, in a film set. Thank you so much. You. Uh, we do have another question here from Michelle K. Michelle, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Marcus? And it looks like Michelle's having some trouble. So I will go ahead and pose this for her. Do you believe okay. it's important for a black man to tell a black man's story and why? Yes. And because in this, in this particular, uh, so I will say perhaps not in every circumstance because I do believe there are really good directors, really passionate and authentic directors who can cover some of the subject matter. Um, but with this particular subject matter of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, um, I think it's, I think, yes, a black man should be, or a black person, excuse me, person of color should be in the role to tell the story because everything about the story is racially charged. Everything about these men's lives is racially charged. You cannot understand Muhammad Ali or Malcolm X without understanding what that experience is like. And that experience, somebody can tell you about it. You can have a friend. There's nothing like the actual experience. And so these two men made their lives and their career um, fighting against the system, speaking out against a system that was not welcoming to them. Um, they saw things that were traumatizing, that would be traumatizing to anybody. Um, and it's such an important part of their DNA and their makeup. Um, so when I look back at some of this stuff, I'm surprised that so much material was missed, to be honest. And that's because you have to be able to identify the things that are important. You have to be able to understand and put yourself in those shoes to understand what elements might be really important to the story. Um, you know, in, in our film, we, we, we take some time to really set up the influence of Marcus Garvey on Malcolm X. Um, his parents were part of the Garvey movement. His mother was a writer for Garvey's newspaper. Um, this is a really important part of the fabric of who Malcolm X is who he becomes and what his mission in life is. And so it's not a small detail to look over. Um, all of these things are incredibly uh, powerful and compelling. 
you know, even Cash is making his changing his name to Muhammad Ali at that time. You know, this is not this is this is unheard of. And this is a black man doing it at a time when, you know, this was just an insane decision to make. And so so much of everything that drove these men comes back to their identity and to who they are. You know, it's not about boxing. It's not about how fast or swift he was or how nimble he was on his feet. He was a defiant black man. And that's something that's not easy. It's not, you know, to have that kind of confidence, to have that kind of defiance and that strength to say, against all odds, this is what I stand for. This is who I am and this is who I'm going to be. Um, if you haven't had that challenge in your life, I don't think you can understand either of these men. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we have a, uh, a question here from Jasmine Williams, an MFA student from our Los Angeles campus. Jasmine, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Marcus? Hi, Marcus. Um, I wanted to say thank you for your work. Um, my question is, how did you not only um, handle the pressures of honoring such legendary men, but also preparing yourself um, to sculpt a different story and a different story dynamic to such historic figures who have been seemingly well-documented? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I guess, you know, when I came into this project, I knew there was going to be a good amount of responsibility. And as soon as I started the project, I could feel it. It was, it was ever present. It was all around me. Um, you know, these are, like I said, these are heroes and there's a lot of legacy um, involved. And so for me, it was really important creatively um, to present a balanced story uh, that was balanced in the legacy of both men um, that involved the families of both men to get that support is something that was incredibly important to me. It was the first step, so to speak, in terms of, all right, where are we going? Who are we talking to? The first step was reach out to the families. Um, who can we talk to from the families? You know, will they contribute? Um, tell them about the project. And so that was kind of the first kind of opening of the door um, to how to approach it and making sure that it was balanced. And, you know, there was an intense amount of pressure to just make sure that I got the story right. Um, I understand how important this story is. Uh, I also understand how rare the opportunity someone like me um, to be in this position to tell this story. And so uh, it, was a, it was a weight that I, that I carried with me, um, but it wasn't negative at all. It was positive. It was help, It was like a motivating factor. And, um, you know, I reached out to the family on Malcolm X's side. Um, and one of the first conversations I had was with one of his daughters. And she really laid out for me um, how challenging this film and this story was going to be, um, that there weren't a lot of friends and family around to really uh, shed light on the story and just the gravity of it. And that was something that really kind of inspired me and made me realize just what the journey was going to be that I was on. And so during that conversation, some of the insight I got was some of the areas where they felt um, other documentarians had gone wrong, that we've seen a lot of the same Malcolm being angry and fiery and intimidating. Um, you know, we've kind of seen these same images over and over again. And so I set out to with my team to make a lot of creative decisions that were against the narrative of what Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali are um, in a way that's natural, not in any type of forced way, but something as simple as let's start the movie with Malcolm X smiling, this big, beautiful, dazzling smile that he has. Um, because in that moment and in those moments when he's with Cassius Clay, he, these moments to me look like some of the happiest moments in their life. You know, they look like brothers, they're enjoying each other's company, there's admiration, there's compassion, um, there's a certain feeling that you can see in the photos. And so making decisions like that intentionally um, give you a totally different perspective on something or someone you thought you knew. And so there's a lot of decisions that went into that. As a filmmaker, I make those decisions a lot when I start a project. I'll always immerse myself in the material watch everything that exists on the subject matter, no matter what it is, and then try to make decisions that I haven't seen in any of that material. So, you know, Malcolm X is a great speaker. He's a master orator, we know that. So I'm only gonna use the speeches and the moments that are really gonna help to bolster the story that we're telling. You're not gonna see by any means necessary. 
you're not going to see the ballot or the bullet because you've seen that. You know, there's a certain amount of calculation in this film that had to be done around what do people already know about these men, right? This is not like the first movie about them. And so there's, there's knowledge that I'm expecting the audience to come to the table with already. Um, and then making further decisions to really um, make sure that we're showing something different. And that goes, you know, that's something you have to really do intentionally um, and make those decisions. And they're tough to make, but you, through the process of doing that and repeating that process, you end up having a totally different perspective on these men. Um, just by having compassion and saying, I don't want you to be scared of Malcolm X. Why would you be scared of Malcolm X? He's a fighter for civil rights and for people's freedoms and for justice in America. Nobody should be scared of that. How did you win the family over? The families? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, how did I win them over? I, I don't know if I would say win, I won them over, but uh, <laughs> myself and my producer, um, Jason Perez, were very uh, persistent in talking to, reaching out to, contacting, staying in touch with the family, um, both families. And, you know, for the record, it wasn't easy. <laughs> um, to, be, to be completely honest, Miriam Ali had, had said no several times um, to us several times. And, and not because of any, not because she didn't want to necessarily, but you have to imagine every time a documentary is done on these men, people reach out to them, right? So there is a certain degree of, you know, fatigue, which totally makes sense, is understandable, is natural. Um, but for this film, it was so important to us to get them involved, to have their blessing, and to get them to really um, explain kind of the thought process um, of these two men and what they stood for and how they could have seen each other and what they knew. Um, because, you know, Mary Ali had conversations with her father about the specific relationship. Hana Ali had conversations with her father about this exact relationship, as did um, Ilyasa with, with Muhammad Ali, and, so, and her older sister as well, uh, Atala Shabazz. And so um, it was, we just, we were really persistent. We didn't say, we didn't allow, you know, we respected the no, but we came back and we would ask again and we would ask in a different way or let them know what was happening with production and say, hey, we're filming something, blah, 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 like, you know, and we really had to dig deep, both of us, um, in that outreach. And we did. And we had to put it out there and let them, you know, really explain why this was so important to us, let them know who we were, um, where do we come from, what are we about, what do we believe in? These were things we offered. They didn't ask us this. We, we offered this information to let them understand where our motivations were um, and where we were coming from. And so we were authentic, we were honest, um, but we were persistent. And that made all the difference. It made all the difference. But they knew your point of view um, about how you're gonna present the friendship and so on and so forth, right? Well, not, not exactly. Um, not exactly. They, I think they knew my intentions. They knew my intentions and they knew my producer, Jason Perez, his intentions. Um, they understood where we were coming from. And I think that process really helped uh, to, to build trust. Um, with any documentary, no matter how short, you know, you're working with somebody or you're just doing an interview for an hour or two, um, every film I've done, all of the interviews, what you're watching is a process of gaining trust. It's a, it's a conversation, but it's really a process of gaining trust. And, um, you know, when you're interviewing somebody, your, your eyes are locked, um, you're exchanging energy, you know what I mean? There is an exchange of energy. And so through your questioning and through kind of that chemistry, people get a really good sense of who you are and where you're coming from um, and what your intentions are. And I think after we got through some of that, um, I think it really helped to show where we were going with this. Um, but at that time, to be 100% honest with you, I didn't have a full, this is how it starts and this is how it ends. I didn't, I wasn't able to talk through it like that. It was, right. and I was still, I was still in, so much of this process was discovery for me because I didn't know they were friends. I didn't know how deep it went. I didn't know they were, their families reached out to each other later on in life. I didn't know any of that information. Uh, really? So this was all discovery for me. Oh, wow. And as, as fate would have it. In the book, I thought it was in the book no the 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 tail end of so the the third act in terms of muhammad ali's regret turning into remorse turning into him extending himself to the shabazz family 
that's not represented in the book in the manner in which we show it, we depict it in the film. Um, that information they didn't have, they didn't have those interviews. Um, and so that was really, that was new information that we've brought to this story, which I think is really powerful and puts kind of a bookend. Yeah, it puts a bookend on the whole relationship and it shows this symbolic gesture from Muhammad Ali trying to make right. You know, it's a redemption move. And so that's incredibly powerful and just shows, you know, the bond of their families, um, they're connected, they're, they're interconnected now. Um, you know, they refer to each other as like cousins and aunties, you know what I mean? And so that bond is something, um, you know, the knowledge of that bond came out of these interviews. And I, what I was gonna say before is as fate would have it, the last interview that we did and only by fate was Ilyasa Shabazz. And it's not because we scheduled it that way. It just happened to fall that way in the schedule. But what I will say is I needed all of the information from every single interview that I did to be prepared for that interview, to know what questions to ask. Right. I could have gone into that interview and asked a whole bunch of questions, just kind of throwing darts at the wall. Um, and it wouldn't have been as fruitful. But the reason it was fruitful is because I was armed with all of this information from all of these different interviews and all of this research. So by the time that moment happened, I had questions that unlocked something else that, that we didn't know about at that time. Well, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It Thank worked. you. No, I'm Thank asking you. all this because for the students to learn also, you know, how you yeah, do of course. such a great documentary. Do we have another question from the student? We do. Um, we have a question from Jabo Moore from our New York campus. Um, Jabo asks, how did working on a documentary as powerful as Blood Brothers and working with numerous civil rights activists and influential individuals within the African-American community impact you personally? Oh, man. Well, um, before I started this project, I didn't have all this hair. <laughs> I didn't quite look like this before this project. Um, it had a pretty dramatic impact on me, if I can be honest. Um, part of that is because we went into lockdown simultaneously as we were going to edit the film. Um, so we finished shooting principal photography in the end of February, 2020. And so the next month, everything shut down and we went into lockdown for the pandemic. And so the whole post-production process has been in isolation. We kind of re had to rethink post and editing and how we edit virtually and come up with new systems so we can all work, um, but be separate and isolated. And so against the backdrop of the George Floyd protests, um, the insurrection at the Capitol building, all these crazy things happening, um, we're working on this film and I'm working with this material. And so, you know, I had to really dig deep personally, um, mentally, spiritually, uh, not only to just keep the motivation going, um, but to stay focused on what my mission was which is completing this film and getting this story out um, to the world. And so, as you can imagine, um, you know, watching so much of Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, and watching so much of Malcolm X and all of his speeches and just consuming all of this material um, had a pretty dramatic effect on just myself, how I carry myself, how I view the world um, and what I think this film needed. Uh, but it really helped me in terms of digging deep um, into myself, into my heritage, into my culture, into where I come from, uh, my upbringing. All those things were constant, you know, questions um, and constant things that I was, I was dealing with. Uh, so, you know, it had a profound effect on me. And, you know, the story is a destiny story, right? These men believed in destiny. They really believed in destiny. And here I am making this film and trying to connect you know, the breadcrumbs of history to tell the story, to show their influence, to bring Marcus Garvey in. And so it was really, you know, it's deeply personal and, and spiritual. You know, I'm named after Marcus Garvey. My parents are from Jamaica. And so this was something that was uh, really near and dear to me because I felt like, again, I had a responsibility to tell the story, to do it right, but then also to infuse messages into the material. Um, beneath the surface of the story is a lot of different messages for people, um, for the community, for the culture. Uh, and so, you know, it had a real effect on me. It had a real effect on my, on my craft. Um, and I tried to kind of push all of that energy into the film. Thank you. Um, I have another question here from a uh, 
student in our LA campus, uh, Maggie, who asks, how does your process vary when working on a doc feature versus working on an episode in an existing doc series? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, so uh, it, the, sh the short answer is it doesn't. Because for me, for me um, and this is something, <laughs> you know, for a small amount of time, I was a film runner for Spike Lee. Um, and being around that environment, um, you know, I was a production assistant, I was like very low on the totem pole, um, but I was able to be around, fly on the wall and just listen and hear things and overhear conversations. And in that camp, you're always making a movie. Doesn't matter if it's a commercial, it doesn't matter if it's a 15 second spot, it doesn't matter what it is, if there's a camera involved, you're making a movie. And so my ethos now to this day is the same thing. Um, no matter what I'm working on, I'm making a movie. It could be branded content. It could be, I'm always trying to make it as cinematic as possible, as deep as possible. Uh, I'm always trying to show somebody something new or a new perspective on somebody they thought they knew. Um, for me personally, in my style, it's all about film. Um, it's all about filmmaking. And so that can be in different iterations, but like you know, when I'm doing a series like Unsolved Mysteries uh, or Rapture, um, both on Netflix, everything that I approach, I'm approaching it like it's a film. It might be 60, 60 minutes or, you know, it might be whatever, but it's always, for me, the practice is it's always a film. And so if it's a commercial, there's rules that change a little bit. You know, some of the rules are different in the commercial world. Um, in the TV world, as they say, traditional TV, the rules are a little bit different, but for my particular style and craft, I'm always making a movie. And so sometimes that frustrates people <laughs> that I might be working with or like, you know, people who are not used to that mentality. Um, but if your goal is to make films, feature films, then everything you shoot should be, you should approach it as if it's a film, as if it's a feature film. Don't make a distinction because if you're making a distinction, you're making some, you're, you're then saying, oh, this is less than what I'm going for. This is less than that. Don't do that because that's not a good way to practice. You want to practice how you want to play, right? Which is, I want to be making features. And so everything that I touch when I'm having a camera in my hand is going to be a feature. It's going to be a film. Interesting. That's great advice. I, uh, I have one more question here from a Gabby Cayo uh, from our New York campus. Um, Gabby asks, uh, the interviews for Blood Brothers were quite cinematic. Uh, there was also a huge range of shot sizes for each interviewee, in some instances going from a very wide shot and then straight into a close-up. What can you tell me as a cinematography student was your intention behind these choices? That's a great question. It's a really good question. Um, yeah, so when I go into a film, I first come up with, like part of my process is I come up with, um, especially when it's when it's a document documentary with uh, several interviews. What's the interview style going to be? Right, that's a decision that consciously made um, before we shoot anything. And so, um, what you want to do, or what I tend to do, is I create a set of rules for myself, um, almost like a science around why I'm choosing certain um, angles or, or or frame sizes or positions. Initially with this, and this, this change, this is a fluid thing, but you wanna have a concept for how you're gonna do it. So you give yourself um, some parameters, right? Initially, because we had a, a, a good amount of subjects that actually met Muhammad Ali and actually met Malcolm X, and we had some subjects who knew both of them. And so initially it was the people who actually had firsthand experience, we're gonna put them closer to the center of the frame. The people who knew one or the other, we're gonna put them further on the left or the right of the frame. This is in, the, in, the, um, in our close-ups mostly. This was kind of the science that we decided between the director of photography and myself. It's a conversation that I always have with my DP. Um, and so there are definitely times we broke those rules or depending on what room we were in, what's in the room, the science wouldn't apply or didn't work or there wasn't, you know, we didn't have a right um, the depth wasn't right behind them or the colors looked weird. So we would have to break the rules, but we started with that framework. Um, and so, you know, you wanna have a kind of, you wanna have these creative decisions in advance. Um, so you know what you're doing when you get there. 
um, and then you want to execute. So I'm glad you picked up on that because that is something that is always front of mind um, when I'm approaching a film. And then also you want to make sure that there's balance there because you don't want everybody on the left side of the frame. <laughs> and then the whole time everybody's you know looking in one direction, you really, as you're going, you have to be conscious of those decisions that you've made previously so that you don't end up with everybody on the right side of the frame or too many people on the right side of the frame. And so if you notice Johnny Smith and Randy Roberts, the authors, I knew they were gonna be you know, significant voices in the film because of their, the information and the research that they have. And so I made sure that they gotta be on opposite ends of the frame because they're gonna be playing off of each other. I expected that. And so we made, we, we made a conscious decision to make sure they're on opposite sides of the frame. So they complement each other. Um, all of these creative decisions are what creates your film's look, you know? And so you really wanna have those decisions and, and know why you're doing them. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll see shots in documentaries that are unmotivated um, and they kind of just, they don't fit within what you're watching. And so my suggestion is always to, the position of your camera should always be motivated by something. Um, and you have to know what that is. Sometimes it's the location and just what you can see behind them. Sometimes it's the subject. Sometimes it's the information that you expect to get from the subject. Um, you know, if you see Melchizedek Shabazz Allah in the film, he's in a, in a black room, beautifully lit with these, you know, circular tables above and below him. Um, I went into that kind of expecting a certain degree of a certain temperature, if you will, of information. And so all of these pieces, you know, you want to be making those decisions consciously. Um, because that arrangement is what essentially makes up your film. Um, so I hope that answers some of that. With our wide shots, we really try to give, um, you know, something different, you know. Um, wide shots sometimes can be really boring. And so we wanted to spice those up. We wanted to give a little bit more of uh, the viewer uh, a sense of the environment that we're in, um, which was really important. And for me also, this is the last thing I'll say, um, our, our tight shots, our close-ups, the camera's always moving. Uh, it's always moving. And little decisions like that, whether or not your cameras are moving, whether or not they're static, whether or not your wide shot is moving, all these decisions are things you wanna plan out um, before you go into a shoot. Thank you so much for that advice. Uh, Tova, um, I know that you have uh, some more that you'd like to chat to Marcus about, so I will give it yeah, back to I you. think that we have time maybe for one more question and maybe it's the big question, which is, what is the one thing that you hope the audience will take away from this film? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things I think people should take away, but it's, it's, the first thing is, I think it's hard to watch this film and this relationship um, and not wonder what would have happened if Malcolm X hadn't been assassinated, right? Malcolm X is assassinated at 39 years old. Um, that's really young, you know, Muhammad Ali lived to 74, essentially a whole nother lifespan. And so when you look at what's happening today um, or last year with the George Floyd protests and everything, it's like, you know, how would history be different if, if Malcolm X weren't assassinated? He was working on these exact issues. Yeah. Exactly what we are dealing with today, um, what the protests are about is exactly what he was trying to curtail. He was trying to address this issue with a coordinated disciplined, diplomatic response to discrimination, to police brutality. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, how would things be different? Could we have solved some of these problems or could they be better? You know, would you need the Black Lives Matter movement right now? How would the Black Lives Matter movement be different? All these kinds of questions. But at the core, the core message is we're too easily divided. Um, black and brown people, we are, we're too easily divided. The strange part is that um, as they were divided, it wasn't that easy. <laughs> if you notice like Cash, Muhammad Ali is trying to hold on to it. Malcolm X is trying to hold on to it. They're trying to hold on to this friendship. They're like, eh, yeah, I know he messed up, you know, but he's my brother. You know, they're, they're trying to hold on to this relationship. Um, and so it wasn't that easy for them, but in general, you know, these outside forces that divided them um, in many ways still exist. They might be in a different form. Um, they might be in a different manner, but I think we have to remember when there's uh, 
you know, large degrees of success and large, uh, someone has a mission that they're trying to accomplish for the greater good, um, that we have to remember to zoom out, that we have to kind of put some of these smaller beefs, if you will, and just, you know, just you know, this crabs in a barrel mentality. We have to put that to the side. We need more unity and we need to support each other because look how powerful this relationship was. And it was only three years, three years. And look at the impact it had on Muhammad Ali. And so what would the impact be if that was a 20 years? <laughs> Right. Like, you know what I mean? For people. And so I think all these questions, you know, the film raises and your imagination can run wild with how things could be different. Thank you so much. I really want to thank you for coming here. You're and, you know, uh, letting us know what was in your head as a filmmaker, as a black man. Um, I, the subject, you eliminate, illuminated two giant, giant people, really. Thank you. And we are gonna try and do our best in doing a little social media about it and try and spread the word. And um, we thank you once again for coming and answering questions about filmmaking and about this particular documentary. It was a pleasure, namaste. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it.